So, this is the Diamond Sutra. It contains approximately about 5,800 word Chinese characters. And the Chinese characters. How many English words? I don't know. So, we, we can count it, but... Oh, we can... Uh, not right now, we can count it by computers. That's good. So, I will, we'll have to find out how many words. And this Sutra... It's one of the most important sutras, and um, in China, they call it uh, the treasure of all, of all sutras. So, today is the first time when we start with it, and uh, um, but in the first day, we, what we have to do is we have to find out why is this Diamond Sutra important. Let's do an introduction to it. And the reason why we distribute it is just want to hold it and make sure that you know what we're talking about. Diamond Sutra, and in the Sanskrit language, it should be called uh, the Vajra Chattika uh, Sutra, or some, some people translate it into uh, Vajra Prajna. Sutra. Why is the Diamond Sutra important? What's, uh, what's the reason for the Diamond Sutra being so important? The Diamond Sutra is like a, a summary of the composite literature of Prajna. Prajna, you know Prajna. Um, nobody can understand Buddhism without understanding Prajna. And as I talk more and more into it, you will, you will find out why. And so today, we just used approximately about half an hour to explain the importance of the sutra and why this prajna important. Um, you know that the, the canon of prajna contains a lot of literature. And it's important to know about it, uh, not just to directly get into the meaning of, of the Diamond Sutra, you have to know why it it stands as, as a very important position and why uh, it is affecting uh, every school of Buddhism. Buddha Sakyamuni taught the Dharma for 49 years, 2,600 years ago approximately. So Buddha Sakyamuni was the historical Buddha in this world and he taught for 49 years after enlightenment. And uh, out of the uh, 49 years, he spent 22 years on the subject of prajna, off and on and off and on in different congregations, 22 years. And this is the longest time he spent on the subject. And remember the three foundations of Buddhism that you really have to remember. Uh, sila, translated as morality or ethics, Samadhi, translated as meditation, and prajna, uh, translated as wisdom. So, so morality, meditation, and wisdom. These are the three foundations. Um, the other day I was also explaining in Chinese or over in the cafeteria uh, why it is still important. Uh, and I, I, I gave an example which I think would be appropriate. Silla, you see, is you see uh, our defilements, our mental defilements can be classified into three groups, three categories. Mental defilements uh, that bother us in our mind. And we can, why do we, why do we, uh, why do we bring karmic action into the next life? It's all because of the origin is the mind, the mental defilements. And there's three classifications of these defilements. The first classification is defilements pertaining to uh, latent defilements, which means that um, 
these defilements are like seeds hidden in your consciousness. These, are, these only seeds there at the, at the latent um, level. So this is what we call sometimes called the stage of latency. Uh, these defilements are very difficult to know and they are hidden like soil, like seeds under the soil. Under the soil of your mind, they don't come out but they're always there. You may not re even realize these defilements. Uh, they are seeds, the, the stage of latency. And there's also defilements when these seeds arise to the consciousness level. In other words, it comes up to your mind. This becomes the stage of manifestation. So that's why we always in our mind, we have greediness, jealousy, hatred, violence, disappointment, anxiety, uh, you name it. All these things is at the stage of manifestation in our mind because our mind always is involved with it. Whatever you're doing, or actions, or speech, you always are involved with these defilements. But that already comes up to the consciousness level. Before is at the latency level. Latency level, you don't know about it. Only up to the manifestation level. And some people may not even know at the manifestation level, they have this mental defilements. They just commit, commit the crime, commit the mistakes. So remember there's a stage of latency, the stage of manifestation in your mind, and the third is what? The stage of transgression. These defilements, when all circumstances meet, all conditions fulfill, these defilements would carry into speech and action. In other words, if a person kills, the stage of manifestation all of a sudden arises to transgression because you already have performed the action. You perform the action out. You are yelling, you, are, you, you get crazy, you get mad, you get violent, you get hatred, you get jealousy. All this is already, you perform it. When you perform it, it's already at the stage of commitment. Too late. You already have committed to faults. You already have committed to karmic force. You have already done it. At a crime level, for example, people who kill, who rape, who rob, who, who st st stealing, all these criminal acts, they already have arrived at the transgression level. The karmic force has already been performed. So these are the three classifications of every single thought, of every single defilement in our mind. So, how, how are these defilements related to the foundations of Buddhism? Morality, meditation and wisdom. Take an example, as I said before, I like to give example. Take an example of a country. See if your whole, this is regarding, these defilements are regarding each individual. Everybody has it. If you don't have these defilements, you wouldn't have become, come, you wouldn't come to the human realm. Your defilements probably are not ex extremely bad and not good. That's why you become humans. Those defilements are extremely bad and you already have the transgression done, committed, you could have gone to the three vicious realms, animal realm, ghost realm, and the hell realm. But you reincarnated in the human realm, that means you have committed both good and bad, and, and bad a little bit more than the, than the good ones. So, take an example of assuming you as an individual, you are a country, an example of a country, and the Siller morality is just like the armed forces of the country. When all these foreigners attack your country, your armed forces got to be sent out to protect the country. So Siller or morality protect the individual at the crude level, that is at the transgression level. Before it carry into action, your mind has always been thinking, manifested already all these defilements, but before before you, all these enemies attack you, assuming this is the fireman's uh, outer uh, enemies attacking you, you send your armed forces to defend it. So your precept, your sealer, 
become the armed forces protecting you from being destroyed, protecting you from committing the crime, committing the transgression. You see what I mean? They are the armed forces at the outer realm protecting you. If you have taken the precepts, if you observe the precepts, if you observe morality, if you don't even observe morality, you don't even learn the precepts, you're being attacked by outside forces, that means you committed the crime, you committed transgression, you committed the mistakes, the errors already. But if you have this foundation of sila, of morality, before you carry these wrong actions, the sila come out to, to stop you. The sila would say, hey, stop, don't kill, don't rape, don't rob, don't do this, this is bad, this is wrong. The, the armed forces, the sila, the morality would come out to stop you if you have learned the precepts, if you intend to observe the precepts. For those who don't have any armed forces, they don't really care about precepts, they don't really care about morality, they have no armed forces. When all these outsiders attack, the country is going to be destroyed because at the front end, there's no armed forces. However, only having armed forces and not having policemen at home is not also safe. You already have observed this morality. You have armed forces protecting you. But there's no policemen in the country. In, in other words, the, the country, internally, it's all mixed up. Crime still inside, even though you can protect your country from foreign attack, but you still have internally, you still have this chaos. And meditation comes in. Samadhi. That's like a policeman within yourself, in your mind, that protect you, that tells you, hey, this is wrong. You've been meditating. So the samadhi or meditation protects you at the stage of manifestation level. When all these seeds of defilements comes up to your mind and manifest it, the policemen tell you, don't manifest it. Because at the stage of meditation, the mind tells you, even before it carry into actions, it already at the manifestation level, the policeman will stop you. So that's an example for samadhi, for meditation. It, it's, it stops defilements it stops the, the fine defilements, not the crude ones. The crude one will be stopped by the armed forces. The next crude or the finer defilements will be stopped by the policeman internally, by you, by the policeman. Now having the armed forces and having the policeman is not enough. You've got to have the central government that develop, that protects, that provides Medicare, that provides protection, that provides development, that provides education and all that. The central government, now that's prajna, that's wisdom. With armed forces and policemen and no wisdom at home, there's no central government. There's no good government to protect you. So you've got to have this central strong government at home, in your mind, to protect you. So you need that wisdom. And that's the ultimate. And that central government deals with the finer defilements. The central government of your mind define, deals with what? The seeds, the hidden ones, before they come out. It develops the country for you. You see what I mean? So you need three armed forces, just armed forces, just morality, not enough. Not enough.